All right. So Christian and Hopeful departed from the delectable mountains. Uh, we, they came across a little crooked lane leading from the country of deceit. At that intersection of the crooked lane and the King's Highway, they met ignorance, who, as you now have read stage 10, is a tragic figure in the Pilgrim's Progress. We'll return to him in just a moment. Uh, they initiate a dialogue with ignorance. He doesn't want to talk, and so uh, they decide that they're going to go on ahead and let ignorant kind of lag behind. By the way, by the end, did you notice that Bunyan describes him as um, stumbling along, right? He's just barely making it. Um, next, they see Turnaway from the town of Apostasy, uh, and he is being carried into that, uh, that cave in the side of the hill that is the entrance into hell. Both of these, uh, Turnaway is, is held forth as yet another example of uh, apostasy, the danger of quitting the Christian pilgrimage. And, uh, and, and so that reminds Christian of the story of Little Faith. Um, he had heard about this man, Little Faith, who was assaulted by uh, three rogues whose names were Faint Heart, Mistrust, and Guilt. Uh, they steal everything from him but his jewel, which I think functions in the same way as Christian's certificate. It is the, the deed of his uh, inheritance. It is what he will turn in at the gate of the celestial city that grants him entrance. And uh, Hopeful asks him why, as he's left penniless and he has to starve and beg his way the rest of the journey, why doesn't he sell his jewel? And that launches Christian into this explanation of how he, he couldn't sell his jewel. No, no real pilgrim would sell their inheritance for a single meal, which of course is Esau language from Hebrews chapter 12. So we see what Bunyan's doing here is he's, he's taking um, turnabout or turn away rather and all of the other apostate figures that we've seen and he's comparing him with little faith and he's doing so intentionally. Like, why not compare him with Christian and hopeful? Well, Christian and hopeful have had their trials, absolutely, and Christian is barely going to make it through the river, as, as we know. But little faith is, is one of those figures that we, you know, you encounter in the Christian life, and, and maybe this represents you, uh, where your whole way has been difficult. Your whole way has not had anything amounting to the triumphs of Christian over Apollyon, right? You know, um, rejoice not over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will rise again. He thrusts the sword up and sends uh, the fearsome fiend, the foul fiend away, right? Little faith stumbles into the celestial city, but he makes it. And he, what Bunyan is doing is contrasting little faith who what he had, though small, was real. And he contrasts that with all of the other apostate characters who lacked the most important thing, namely uh, saving faith. Uh, it's, pun, it's one of Bunyan's uh, recurrent themes in his works that it's not, the, it's not the strength of our faith that saves, it's the strength of the object of our faith. And so the one with little faith is saved, he's just as saved as the one with great faith. And that's a comforting thought, isn't it? Uh, we, we could very quickly run past this story because we don't even meet this figure. Right? He's just, he just comes to us not only secondhand, but thirdhand. You have the, the dreamer telling us about the allegory, and then you have Christian telling us about a story he heard. But it's an important point, and it's one that is going to come up again in the second part. Because you remember I told you that um, in the second part, you have this, this growing company of pilgrims that are making the journey together. And there's, there's one of them that comes the whole way on crutches. There's another one who has to be rescued from the giant. And, and Greatheart, the pastoral figure, is going to have this great speech. And we'll get there in the second or third stage of part two when he says, uh, and I have a commission from the king to bring along not only those who are strong, but those who are weak. So uh, the, don't, don't miss the encouragement that is supposed to come to us from this story of little faith. Well, so they go on and um, 
They come to the flatterer, uh, but because they have not been looking at the map that the shepherd gave them, uh, they're standing there at this fork in the road wondering which way they should go, and the flatterer comes and says, hey, I'm going to the celestial city. You should, uh, you should come along with me. And, and so he takes them on one of the forks of the road, but little bit by degrees, he begins to turn away until the road is, is going in exactly the opposite direction. And then at the right moment, he springs brings a trap and he catches them in his net and Christian and Hopeful have to be rescued by a, an angel who comes and disciplines them severely, um, asks them the, those convicting questions. Well, didn't, didn't the shepherds give you a map? Yes. Well, why didn't you? Well, we neglected to get it out of our pockets. We neglected to read the word, right? And uh, so we have that that episode, uh, the, the temptation of the flatterer, and then they come to the enchanted ground. And uh, hopeful, you remember it was Christian that took them uh, into Bypass Mat- Meadow and led them, it was Christian's sin that led them into uh, the episode with Doubting Castle where they became prisoners of the giant despair. But this time it's hopeful who feeling... Um, drowsy says, what, what, would, what would the harm be of a little nap? And Christian, who has learned the lesson of the discipline, that's the function of the, God's fatherly discipline, Hebrews 12 in our lives, he remembers that and he says, no, I'm going to heed the shepherd's advice and not fall asleep. So I tell you what we should do, we should, uh, we should entertain ourselves with lively discourse, right? In other words, we should enter into a good theological conversation, um, I think last week I didn't spend too much time dealing with, in between the flatterer and the enchanted ground, they meet this character called Atheist, right? Uh, atheist had unsuccessfully searched for the celestial city for some 20 years, uh, but not finding it, he had turned around to return to his former home. He's another apostate figure, right? He went on pilgrimage, searching for the celestial city, didn't find it, decided it doesn't exist, and now he's turned around and he's going to go uh, back home and he's going to live it up while he can. Uh, Atheist represents those, so Bunyan lived at the very dawn of what's called the Age of Enlightenment. And so there were, although it's doubtful that Bunyan would have ever run into this, these figures, he certainly wouldn't have run into David Hume, who lived a century later, but Thomas Hobbes was a, a, a contemporary of Bunyan, likely would never have met, although Bunyan spent a lot of time in uh, in London, so you, you never know. But um, the, there were beginning to be these, these uh, skeptics uh, at the dawn of the Age of Enlightenment who began to question, they first began by questioning the authority of Scripture, they questioned the miracles of Christ, they questioned, that led them to questioning the resurrection, then they, they just jettisoned everything. Uh, and that kind of launched us into uh, this, this brand of modernism that uh, has prevailed for so long. Uh, we're now coming out of modernism to a philosophical age known as postmodernism, but that's a topic for another time. Uh, Christian and Hopeful, anyway, are unmoved by atheists. They have seen the celestial city, you'll remember. Uh, The shepherds of the delectable mountains took them up to a high hill and gave them a perspective glass. I think that is an image of um, preaching when in the midst of the gathered church, right? They opened up the scripture and they gave them a view of, uh, of the celestial city. So they've seen the celestial city. Uh, from the delectable mountains. They, they are committed to walking by faith and not by sight. And they've remembered the discipline they received from the shining one for listening to the last flatterer who came along. So they continue on into the, the enchanted ground. Um, and they're going, to, they're going to keep themselves awake uh, by, by entering into this discourse. Uh, the drowsiness of enchanted ground. What is it that makes the enchanted ground? I, I said last time it reminds me of uh, the field of poppies in the Wizard of Oz, right, where they, they're wandering in and they just feel, what is it, what's the drowsiness of the air? And uh, it could be any number of things. In Bunyan's day, it would have been relief from uh, persecution, uh, the, he, in his experience, in his mind, the dissenting church was, was sharp and faithful and sober and watchful. 
when there was always the threat of persecution. But then 1672 comes along, the Declaration of Indulgence. Um, Bunyan is sprung from jail. Um, but for you know, eight to ten years, there is minimal persecution uh, in England. And at that point, he, he noticed a weakening of the church. And so I think, I think the absence of persecution or what we might call an age of, of relative religious liberty when you've lived most of your Christian life under the threat of persecution, um, it, it can cause drowsiness in the Christian life. I think another air of drowsiness in our day and age would be prosperity. So the absence of persecution, the presence of prosperity can, um, can create the sort of drowsiness that mitigates against that, that sober, watchful, energetic kind of faith that perseveres to the end. And that's what Bunyan is seeking to convey. So uh, they enter into this dialogue, and Christian inquires of Hopeful as to the details of his conversion. Now, we already have heard part of Hopeful's conversion. Uh, when Hopeful, does anybody remember when was Hopeful converted? Where did he come from? He came from Vanity Fair, and the dominant factor uh, in his conversion was what? Watching the suffering of Christian, but particularly of Faithful, who died as a martyr in Vanity Fair. And so uh, when Christian is released from prison and, and gets out of Dodge, Hopeful comes running after him, and he informs him uh, a little bit of his testimony. We're going to hear the rest of his testimony here at the end of stage nine. So Hopeful had lived a worldly life in Vanity Fair, uh, which is an emblem of, of just a worldly city uh, where all of the pleasures and treasures of the world are, are available. Uh, until he was convicted by the faithful testimony and the preaching of Christian and faithful. Uh, at first, Hopeful was resistant to such conviction. Uh, it's interesting in stage 10, he's going to give us some reasons why he thinks that was. Uh, is, can unregenerate men experience for conviction of sin? And the answer that Bunyan gives through the lips of Christian and Hopeful is yes. The, the question is, where does it lead? And so, hopeful for a time was resistant to such conviction, but try as he might, the conviction persisted. And when hopeful finally gave in to the conviction, his first impulse, this reflective of Bunyan, was to reform his life, right? Under conviction of sin, he's going to clean himself up. He's going to stop doing wrong. He's going to start doing right. He's going to become religious. And so, we'll hear how well that went. Uh, beginning at, I thought I must endeavor to mend my life. I gotta find it. Well, if it helps you, Beth, it's on my page 154. <laughs> All right, so Hopeful says this. I thought I must endeavor to mend my life, for else, thought I, I am sure to be damned. And Christian said, and did you endeavor to mend? Yes, said Hopeful, and fled from not only my sins, but from sinful company too, which must have been difficult in Vanity Fair, and betook me to religious duties as prayer, reading, weeping for sin, speaking truth to my neighbors, etc. These things did I, with many others, too much here to relate. And what did you think of yourself? Or, and did you think, your, uh, think yourself well then, said Christian? Yes, for a while, but at last my trouble came tumbling upon me again, and that over the neck of all of my reformations. Christian says, how came that about since you were now reformed? Hopeful says, there were several things brought it upon me, especially such sayings as these. All our righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, Galatians 2, 16. When you have done all of these things, say, we are unprofitable servants, Luke 17, 10. With many more such like, from whence I began to reason with myself thus. If all of my righteousness is filthy rags, if by the deeds of the law no man can be justified, if when we have done all all that we can, we are yet unprofitable servants, then it is but a folly to think of heaven by the law. I further thought thus, if a man runs a hundred pounds into the shopkeeper's debt, and after that shall pay for all that he shall fetch, 
Yet if this old debt stands still in the book uncrossed, for that the shopkeeper may, for that the shopkeeper may sue him and cast him into prison till he shall pay the debt. And Christian says, well, how did you apply this to yourself? Why, I thought thus with myself, I have by my sins run a great way into God's book, and that my now reforming will not pay off that score. Therefore, I should think still under all of my present amendments, but how shall I be free from the damnation that I've brought myself in danger of by my former transgressions? Another thing that has troubled me ever since my late amendments is that if I look narrowly into the best of what I do now, I still see sin, new sin, mixing itself with the best that I can do so that now I am forced to conclude that notwithstanding my former fond conceits of myself and duties, I have committed sin enough in one duty to send me to hell, though my former life had been faultless. And what did you do then? Do? I could not tell what to do until I broke my mind to faithful for he and I were well acquainted, and he told me that unless I could attain the righteousness of a man that had never sinned, neither mine own nor all the righteousness of the world could save me. So, hopeful saying, I learned that there were two problems with that, that sort of innate impulse when under conviction of sin to, to say, I'm just going to stop sinning. I'm going to reform my life. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to become a, 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 I'm going to become a new man and start walking in a new way. He said there's two problems. Uh, number one is what are you going to do about the debt of sin that you've racked up in all of your previous life? If it were possible for you to stop sinning from the moment of conversion on, you still need atonement. Right? I mean, how would it work if... You, you are, you know, arrested for, uh, for holding up the Casey's here on the corner of Wasson and 160, and, and your defense before the judge is, but judge, your honor, I, I passed five Casey's on the way that I didn't hold, and you would pass five Casey's on the way here, by the way, <laughs> that, you, that you didn't hold up, and, I, 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 and then I passed five after that store that I didn't hold up after that. I mean, shouldn't the, shouldn't, shouldn't the stores that I didn't hold up outweigh the stores that I did? Yet that's how so many people think that God will judge them on the last day. So, so he's, the problem number one with the outward reformation, of, with the idea of in order to get right with God, I'm going to change my own life, is you cannot atone for the sins already committed, for the debt that you have already incurred to the holy justice of God. Number two is the hypothesis of the assumption of number one is flawed to begin with. Remember I said, if it were possible to not sin from this point on. He said, I recognize that when I compared my works of righteousness with the righteous standard of God, that even the best of my works were so corrupted by sin that they became, there was enough in those new works of righteousness corrupted by sin to damn me, let alone all of the sins I had previously committed. In other words, the way is shut every which way you turn if you try to save yourself by performing works of the law. That's what hopeful is, is describing here. Two reasons justification by works of the law will not satisfy. Number one, good works do not negate the debt of sin's past. If they did, then there would have been no blood in the Old Testament. But everywhere the people of God are found, there are also altars by God's ordination. Number two, even our righteous acts are corrupted by sin such that we never actually accumulate the righteousness for which we strive. We only actually add to our debt. So Hopeful knew not what to do until he confided in Faithful, who informed him that he needed the perfect righteousness of another. Uh, at first, this sounded strange, but the more Hopeful spoke with Faithful, the more he was convinced of its truth. Then Faithful expounds more fully the doctrine of justification by faith. Christian says, and did you ask him what this man, what man this was that has this righteousness and how you might be justified by him? And Hopeful says, yes. And he told me it was the Lord Jesus that dwelleth on the right hand of the Most High. 
And thus said he, you must be justified by him, even by trusting to what he hath done by himself in the days of his flesh, and suffered when he did hang on the tree. I asked him further how that man's righteousness could be of that efficacy to justify another before God. And he told me he was the mighty God himself, and did what he did, and died the death also, not for himself, but for me, to whom his doings and the worthiness of them should be imputed if I believed on him. And what did you do then? Well, I made my objections against my believing, for that I thought he was not willing to save me. And what said faithful to you then? He bid me go to him and see. I said this was presumption. He said no, for I was invited to come. Then he gave me a book of Jesus, his indicting to encourage me the freely, more freely to come. And he said concerning that book that every jot and tittle thereof stood firmer than heaven and earth. Uh, this, this is Bunyan's opportunity to give you the doctrine of justification by faith. Uh, this, this is his exposition of the, the core of the Protestant gospel, which is to say the core of the biblical gospel. So the way of, the way of works is closed any way you look at it. If you were to be perfectly righteous from this moment on and never sin the rest of your life, that does not atone for sins past for the debt already accumulated to the justice of God. Furthermore, you can't stop sinning because even your righteousness is as filthy rags. Even your best works are so corrupted and infected by selfishness and sin that they only add to the debt of sins past. What you need then, faithful tells hopeful and Bunyan tells us, what you need then is the righteousness of, of another, a righteousness that is perfect and uncorrupted. And that's the righteousness that is revealed in the gospel, Romans 3.21. Um, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God is revealed, being manifested by the law and the prophet, or being witnessed to by the law and the prophets, even that righteousness which is by faith, to all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, whom God put forward as a propitiation to be received by faith. So the gospel is that God requires a righteousness of you that in your fallen condition you cannot give him but that God gives you the righteousness that he requires in the person of his son and that you receive that righteousness not by works but apart from works through faith alone. The gospel is that Christ becomes your substitute in two ways. He takes your iniquities upon himself and pays the debt of sin that those iniquities have accrued. And he gives you his righteousness to cover you in the day of judgment so that at the cross, God entered into judgment against Christ for the sins that you have committed and bore the full penalty of those sins. And on the day of judgment, you will stand before God and be judged for the righteousness that he has performed and receive the reward thereof. Christ bears your penalty, you receive his reward. It's beautiful. And that's the core of Bunyan's hope. And that is the gospel that he wants you to derive from this book. Well, Hopeful has an objection, doesn't he? God will impute to you Christ's righteousness, faithful tells him, if you will believe. And Hopeful says, I, I've lived such a wretched life that I don't think he'll receive me. And faithful says, go to him and see. <laughs> what other choice do you have, right? And he says, no, you're invited to come. And he gives them, him a book of Jesus, the Bible, right? Every jot and tittle thereof stood firmer than heaven and earth. Then I asked him what I must do when I came, and he told me I must entreat upon my knees with all my heart and soul the Father to reveal him to me. Then I asked him further, how must I make my supplication to him? And he said, go, 
and you shall find him upon a mercy seat where he sits all the year long to give pardon and forgiveness to them that come. I told him that I knew not what to say when I came, and he bid me say to this effect, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and make me to know and believe in Jesus Christ. For I see that if his righteousness had not been or I had not faith in that righteousness, I was utterly cast away. Lord, I have heard that you are a merciful God and have ordained that thy son Jesus Christ should be the savior of the world and moreover that thou art willing to bestow him him upon such a poor sinner as I am and I am a sinner indeed. Lord, take therefore this opportunity and magnify thy grace in the salvation of my soul through the son Jesus Christ. Amen. I think this is some of the best writing in uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. So hopeful doubts that Jesus is willing to save him and faithful responds with uh, Bunyan's understanding of the free offer of the gospel, which is that the offer of the gospel is its own warrant to believe. There was a uh, movement it be- beginning in Bunyan's day, but carrying over into the century after, especially known as hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism uh, is not the same thing as Calvinism. Uh, We think of Calvinism as the five points of the tulip, right? Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Um, Bunyan believed all of that to be true. That's not the definition of hyper-Calvinism, whatever Leighton Flowers says. Um, Hyper-Calvinism was a view that sought to take that to what it saw as logical implications for mission. To say then, you have no right to believe the gospel until you know yourself one of the elect. Therefore, it is wrong to preach the gospel to the non-elect. And uh, so this is why God raised up Andrew Fuller and William Carey in Baptist life in, in England in the 18th century. And uh, their, their two works, um, Andrew Fuller's The Gospel Worthy of All Acts, Uh, acceptation, and William Carey's uh, faithful preaching at the Baptist Association of Northampton um, helped to sway the the 18th century London Baptist that no, the Great Commission stands as written, and the warrant to believe is in the gospel itself, that when Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, he means it. In other words, that the job of the church is to get about fulfilling the Great Commission and we are to leave election to God. Um, It's interesting that when Andrew Fuller was going through, famously William Carey uh, in the 1786, I believe, Baptist Association meeting at Northampton, he was trying to to get the association to send out, to send him away on mission to um, Burma, right? And uh, he, he, was, he was preaching and preaching and preaching at this associational meeting, and uh, one, one older gentleman, an older pastor in the association whose name was Ryland, John Ryland, uh, gets up and says, young man, sit down. When the Lord wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it himself. Now, interestingly, interestingly, John Ryland Jr., who was a close friend of Andrew Fuller, disputes whether his dad ever said that. But um, that was certainly the, the ethos of the hyper-Calvinistic Baptists in those days. Uh, but what's interesting is that when Andrew Fuller, so William Carey was the preacher of the modern mission movement. Andrew Fuller was its theologian. He, gave, he wrote this book that, uh, that made a biblical theological argument that the warrant of faith is the word of Christ, not the knowledge of one's own election. And, uh, and you want to know who he uh, reached back to more often than anyone else? Bunyan. He said, this is what Bunyan believed. And w- why did that carry sway? Because everyone had read Bunyan, right? Uh, this was a century later. So th- it's coming from here. That's what Faithful says. Uh, hopeful says, I don't think he'll receive me. And Faithful says, we'll go to him and see because he says he will. In other words, the grounds of your faith is the word of Christ. Well, um, 
Faithful actually gives hopeful something of a, of a sinner's prayer, doesn't he? Uh, which hopeful prays, um, but do you notice something? Uh, what, did something stick out to you? He didn't answer right away. Kind of like Christian knocking at the wicket gate. And did you do as you were bidden? Hopeful says, yes, over and over and over. And did the father reveal his son to you? Not at the first, nor second, nor third, nor fourth, nor fifth, no, nor at the sixth time, neither. What did you do then? Why, I could not tell what to do. Had you not thoughts of leaving off praying? Yes, a hundred times twice told. And what was the reason you did not? Because I believed it was true what had been told me to wit that without the righteousness of this Christ, all the world could not save me. And therefore, thought I with myself, I love this. If I leave off, I die, and I can but die at the throne of grace. You know what, you know what he's saying there? He's saying, where else can I go? I'm, I'm pleading with the Father to reveal his Son to me. I'm pleading for the, the inward felt assurance that my sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, that his Holy Spirit resides with me, and I'm pleading and I'm pleading and I'm pleading for peace of conscience. I'm pleading and nothing's happening, but where else can I go? I have come to believe that I need the righteousness of Christ, and so I'm going to stay here and I'm going to cling to the throne of grace until he gives it to me. And I remember being there. I remember reasoning in my mind, and this, and it, I, I went through a time of just really serious, serious doubts uh, for, for, for two years, uh, 05 to 07, somewhere in there. And I remember, I remember coming to that conclusion that if I... I I have, I'm not, I have no righteousness of my own to claim. I have no other hope but Christ. And until I can get some assurance, if I'm going to be, I remember saying this to myself, to nobody in particular. Maybe I said it to God. Uh, if I'm going to be cast away, you're going to have to, it's sort of like a Charlton Heston thing, right? You're going to have to peel my fingers away from the cross. Like, you know, Charlton Heston, remember the NRA, like, come, come, come take this rifle out of my cold, dead fingers. Um, it was, it was like that, and, and, but here's the thing, here's, and here's actually where assurance came. That's what faith says. Salvation doesn't come when the assurance of salvation comes. Salvation comes when the faith is there that there's nowhere else I can go. And when I realized that, which, by the way, is exactly the same place Bunyan realized it. If you read Grace Abounding, the, the, the verse, if there was one verse above any other that brought him assurance of salvation, assurance of faith, and peace of conscience, it was John 6, 37. All those whom the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. That verse was so meaningful to him that he wrote an entire book on it, and it's a good one. Uh, most of his books are good ones. But that's, that's what faith says. And, and, and actually, you want to know what happened in, in, in my own experience? Assurance didn't come through some sort of immediate uh, divine infusion of feelings of being saved. It came through the recognition that I have faith because there, I know there's nowhere else I can go. And I think that's what Bunyan wrote in this. this. With all this came into my mind, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. He's quoting from Habakkuk 2.8. So I continued praying until the Father showed me his Son. Just like Christian knocked on the wicked gate, until it opened. Why? Because that's what saving faith does. Hopeful's conversation with Christ, I think, is precious. 
uh, and details Bunyan's definition of saving faith and the grounds of assurance. How was he revealed unto you? This is what Hopeful had been praying for. Hopeful says, I did not see him with my bodily eyes, but with the eyes of my understanding, and thus it was. One day I was very sad, I think sadder than at any one time in my life, and the sadness was through a fresh sight of the greatness and vileness of my sins. And as I was then looking for nothing but hell and the everlasting damnation of my soul, suddenly as I thought, I saw the Lord Jesus come down from heaven upon me, saying, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But I replied, Lord, I am a great, a very great sinner. And he answered, My grace is sufficient for thee. Then I said, But Lord, what is believing? Then I saw from that saying, He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And I saw that believing and coming was all one, and that he that came, that is, that ran out in his heart and affections after salvation by Christ, he indeed believed in Christ. He's saying that the assurance of salvation came, again, not from a direct infusion of feelings of love and peace, and, and it came from recognizing that the coming was the believing. The reason why he was seeking Christ so persistently was because he believed that Christ was the only way. The ground of his assurance was the persistent striving, the affectionate striving after Christ. I think that's an important point. Believing and coming was all one, he says. Uh, this is an incredibly important concept in our understanding of assurance. I believe truly if I run out in my heart and affections after salvation by Christ. Hopeful also provides a statement regarding the object of saving faith. What does saving faith believe? Well, from all which I gathered that I must look for righteousness in his person and for satisfaction for my sins by his blood, right? Two things I need, righteousness and propitiation or satisfaction. I need atonement for the sins committed. I need righteousness for the law that I haven't kept and cannot keep. I need righteousness and I need blood. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And what he did in obedience to his father's law and in submitting to the penalty thereof was not for himself, but for him that will accept it for his salvation and be thankful. Now was my heart full of joy, mine eyes full of tears, mine affections running over with love to the name, people, and ways of Jesus Christ. Conversion then had an immediate transformative effect upon hopeful. It changed the way he viewed God himself, the world, and his future life. It transformed his affections. It reoriented his priorities. Uh, he, could no long, he could no more stay in Vanity Fair than he could deny the new identity that he had. Christian and Hopeful then wait for ignorance to catch up, and they inquire of him why he lags behind, and he says that he prefers walking alone. In other words, he cannot abide the fellowship of true saints. Ugh. I got to tell you, I, I, I think that I have yet to be proven wrong here, but I seriously doubt the faith of one who prefers walking alone. My inclination is, my hunch, is that they prefer walking alone because they either are not submitted in their heart to the authority of Christ, they find God boring, they find the fellowship of the saints either tedious or convicting, and any of those rationales are very troublesome. They're indicative of a heart that is unregenerate. And that's going to be true of, of ignorance. Of course he likes walking alone. Uh, he cannot abide the fellowship of true saints. Uh, so they inquire of how it stands between God and his soul. And ignorance says it's good. And when pressed, the ground of his hope is that his heart is good. They say, well, how do you know? Well, his heart tells him, tells him that it's good. 
That's circular reasoning, isn't it? My heart is good. How do you know? Because my good heart tells me that it's good. When pressed, uh, many an unbeliever will claim that they are right with God because they feel that they are right with God. Uh, But Christian's response is apropos. He says, ask my fellow if he be a thief. Thy heart tells thee so. In other words, you don't ask a thief if he's a thief because what's a thief going to say? No, right? Except the word of God bears witness in this matter, other testimony is of no value. Christian then instructs ignorance on the doctrine of original sin and total depravity. Ignorance replies, I will never believe that my heart is thus bad. Christian's discourse with ignorance reveals the fundamental difference between hopeful and ignorance. Hopeful believed and felt what the Word of God said about God and about himself. Hopeful believed and felt what the Word of God said about God and himself. Ignorance believed what he felt to be true about God and himself. Ignorance pretty much just replicates most of the nominal Christians that you'll meet in Nixon, Missouri. He professes to believe what Christian has said about God, sin, and justification, but uh, Christian's not convinced and he presses him further. Uh, at this point, ignorance professes, uh, and here's, a, here's a, a word from the 17th century, uh, the latitudinarian doctrine of justification. Uh, you say, oh, that sound, word sounds familiar. Where have, where have I heard that before? Well, um, so Bunyan entered into a written debate with an Anglican. When we say latitudinarian, that's the 17th century word for theological liberal today. So Edward Fowler was an Anglican bishop who basically believed that everyone who tries their best and stays moderately moral will make it to heaven. God has latitude for sinners. Um, Edward Fowler expressed the same doctrine of justification that ignorance does, and Bunyan answered it in his defense of the doctrine of justification by faith, uh, and, and Christian echoes this almost verbatim. He says, I believe that Christ died for sinners and that I shall be justified. I'm sorry, this is ignorance, right? And this is what Fowler had said. I believe that Christ died for sinners and I shall be justified before God from the curse through his gracious acceptance of my obedience to his law. Or thus, Christ makes my duties that are religious acceptable to his father by virtue of his merits. And so shall I be justified. In other words, I believe that God takes my best efforts and then grades on a curve. As long as I try my best, Christ's merits will boost up my grade to the the passing level. If that sounds like Mormon doctrine, it is. Uh, It's it's what Paul simply in 1 Corinthians would call the wisdom of this world, right? That just makes sense. What is God? Tell me that this this isn't prevailing wisdom in our day. What does God require of you? Just that you do your best, right? And if you do... You'll be justified. Not because, not because God doesn't care about murder. That's why Christ died. Christ died to make your good effort perfect. Well, Christian's going to tear this doctrine apart in, uh, in four statements. Uh, number one, he says, Thou believest with a fantastical faith, for this faith is nowhere described in the word. In other words, you got that out of your own reasoning, not out of divine revelation. This is the wisdom of the world. Number two, thou believest with a false faith because it takes justification away from the personal righteousness of Christ and applies it to thy own. You're standing in your own righteousness, which is complete contrary to what the word of God says. Third, this faith makes not Christ a justifier of thy person, but of thy actions and of thy person for thy action's sake, which is false. And number four, therefore this faith is deceitful even such as will leave thee under wrath in the day of God Almighty. For true justifying faith puts the soul as sensible of its lost condition by the law under flying for refuge unto Christ's righteousness, which righteousness of his is not an act of grace by which he 
maketh for justification thy obedience accepted with God. For his personal obedience to the law in doing and suffering for us that which was required at our hands. This righteousness, I say, true faith accepteth, under the skirt of which the soul being shrouded and by it presented as spotless before God, it is accepted and acquits from condemnation. In other words, justification is not God justifying your righteousness but justifying you on the basis of Christ's righteousness, which wraps you up as in a skirt or a robe. And in that righteousness, you stand before God. It's actually a blaspheming of God to think that he would lower the standard of his holiness to let you slip in on a curve. Or what this is actually saying is, no, 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 no. That's, ignorance would say, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Christ then comes and makes our righteousness perfect. And Bunyan says, that's nowhere in the gospel. You either stand in Christ's righteousness alone or you're not going to stand at all. So ignorance responds that such a doctrine of justification makes good works of no value and it gives free reign to men's lust. And Krishna responds that this is ignorance. For saving faith is always and ever accompanied by renewed affections that bend the heart toward God and Christ to love his name, his word, his ways, and his people. Uh, very, very common from, the, from, from the, uh, the Catholics' response to the Reformation in the 16th century all the way down to, the, to today, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, and the righteousness of Christ alone makes works of no value, and if you make works of no value, men won't do them. The problem with that is that no one ever said that God justifies us apart from a regenerated heart that has renewed affections. That's Paul in Romans chapter 6. But notice what, you remember where I'm, this is Romans 5, 6, and 7. You remember where Paul, for, from Romans 3 to 5, he's been just glorying in the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and the righteousness of Christ alone. And then at the beginning of chapter 6, he raises this objection, which undoubtedly he heard several times. And he, he says, what then? Shall we sin all the more that grace may abound? Does, does, does the doctrine of justification by faith alone uh, amount to a license to sin? And notice what Paul does not say. He does not say, no, 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 you've misunderstood me. It's not that your works don't matter in the justification. No, he says, no, you haven't understood that this righteousness comes with a heart that has been crucified with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. He, he, he goes immediately to the doctrine of regeneration and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. God justifies no one whose heart he has not first renewed and whose heart is not indwelt by his Holy Spirit who gives him new affections and new priorities. That's why you don't, but you don't change the gospel because of that. That's why you don't have to worry that the doctrine of justification by faith will give people a license to sin. God justifies no one that he also does not regenerate. When Hopeful asks him whether he ever had Christ revealed to him from heaven, ignorance essentially calls him a fanatic, a man for revelations. But Hopeful simply quotes what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, that spiritual truth is revealed to spiritual men by the Spirit, and the natural man cannot apprehend such spiritual truths. Uh, Christian also affirms the necessity of effectual calling, you'll note there, and then they depart. Well, stage 10 is uh, Beulah Land, the river of death, and the celestial city. So following ignorance's rejection of their evangelistic efforts, Christian and Hopeful go on by themselves. Uh, Bunyan said, I said stumbling, actually Bunyan's word is hobbling. Ignorance is hobbling on behind. And they discuss ignorance and those like him. Uh, Christian explains ignorance's blindness by a reference first to God's sovereignty. He quotes uh, Isaiah 6.10, He hath blinded their eyes lest they should see. Uh, but then Christian raises an intriguing question. Do men like ignorance experience conviction of sin? Uh, in other words, is there such a thing as conviction that is not proved effectual in the life of a sinner? And Christian answers, yes, because that conviction is suppressed because they don't recognize that such conviction is for their good. 
Uh, Hopeful then suggests that fear, if it be right, is helpful to spur one to go on pilgrimage. But what is right fear? Christian says, well, right fear, godly fear, as opposed opposed to worldly sorrow, uh, is, is marked by three things. It causes saving convictions of sin, or it's caused by saving convictions of sin. It drives the soul to lay fast hold upon Christ, and it begets a continuous reverence for God, His Word, and His ways. In other words, Uh, Christian says, right fear, godly fear has a right source, the Holy Spirit. It has the right effect. It drives people to Christ and it has the right duration. It continues. It doesn't fade away. Why do ignorant persons stifle godly fear? The question is raised. And Christian says, well, they think it comes from the devil. They think it's detrimental to their faith. They think they ought not to fear because faith is not of fear. And they have a vested interest in maintaining their own self-righteousness. And fear is destructive of such righteousness. This is Bunyan waxing eloquent on why, um, why sinners who have... who who demonstrate some initial signs of conviction why they end up not actually being converted. Uh, And he's going to explain it in terms of what Paul in 2 Corinthians 7.10 calls worldly sorrow. You remember that passage? Worldly sorrow leads to a repentance with regret, which leads to death, but godly sorrow leads to repentance and unto life. Uh, And Bunyan, as an evangelist, would have seen a lot of what he would have termed godly sorrow, not or worldly sorrow, not godly fear or godly conviction. So that's what's going on in this uh, this portion of the uh, of the conversation. Christian then mentions the case of temporary who had once experienced some fear over his sins and hopeful says, hey, I remember him well. I am of your mind, for of my, for my house, not being above three miles from his, he would oftentimes come to me, and that with many tears. Truly, I pitied the man, was not altogether without hope for him, but one may see it is not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord. Hopeful then inquires of why temporary and men like him suddenly turn away from their evident awakening, and he speculates that there are four such reasons. Uh, though their conscience was awakened, their mind and their heart was not changed. The fear of man overpowers the fear of God. The shame of Christ rises again uh, once the fear of hell subsides, and the feelings of guilt and terror are grievous to them. Christian then affirms Hopeful's reasons, and he says, but the bottom of all is that they want a change in their mind and their will. So... What are we to learn from this discussion? Because we're going to come on, we're, this is our last part of the Enchanted Ground, and then we're going to move on into Beulah Land. Um, Christian and Hopeful are talking essentially about the practical outworking of the sower and the soils. Do you remember the sower and the soils? Four types of, of soil, right? The man goes out to sow the seed, and some falls among, along the way, and the birds come, and they, they just pluck it up, uh, it never sinks in, and some's cast among the, the rocks, and uh, it springs up quickly, but when the sun rises, it withers away and dies, and some falls among thorns, and it springs up, but then it's choked out, and then uh, some falls in good soil, and it, and it remains and bears fruit 30, 60, 100-fold. And Jesus uh, explains the parable. He says, uh, the first is those for whom the, the word of the gospel never penetrates at all. They just reject out of hand. What's scary is that the other three initially accept. They go on pilgrimage. The, the, the one in the shallow soil, it says when the heat uh, of the sun arises, which represents uh, tribulations and persecutions, their faith withers away and dies. Why? Because it had no root. It was not true. It was not real. Uh, the one that's sown among thorns, these are like those cats that uh, Christian and Hopeful uh, ran into right out of Vanity Fair, right? Um, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches come and choke out their faith, and they prove unfruitful. But the fourth type is the one that are actually born of the Spirit, and that fruit um, that, that 
seed grows up and it bears fruit and the fruit remains. In other words, the only visible difference, the only true evidence that what you've experienced is saving conviction as opposed to worldly sorrow is that it actually proceeds on to a conversion that remains and bears fruit in continuing repentance. Christian says, uh, the bottom of all is the fear of the halter. He's talking about the man who stands, the thief who stands before the judge, and he weeps and he cries. Uh, but what he really fears is the noose, not that he has any detestation of the offense. And then Christian closes the discourse with a nine-step uh, descent into apostasy that reflects, I think, real people that Bunyan had seen. Uh, what, are we to, what are we to take away from this scene? Then we'll move on to, to death. Uh, that sounds weird. Um, fear of hell is an insufficient motivation for saving faith. You don't have to be regenerate to not want to go to hell and to want to go to heaven. Many people start out on pilgrimage out of a desire for heaven motivated by, uh, by sermons and discussions about how wonderful heaven will be. Usually those heavens end up being rather godless and Christless portraits of heaven. Or they begin on pilgrimage out of a sermon that has caused them to be scared of hell. Neither one of those. I'm not saying that it is wrong to preach heaven, as long as you preach it as a Christ-centered heaven, or to preach the terrors of hell. I mean, Jesus did. It's just that those in and of themselves are insufficient evidence of true conversion. It's, it's, it's natural for man to not want to endure punishment for your sins. It's natural for man to want to endure everlasting blessing. And when you look at the anatomy, when you do an autopsy of an apostate, and that's basically what Bunyan has done at a number of points, right? He, he's done an autopsy of, a, of an apostate. This most recent one was temporary. When you do an autopsy of temporary's faith, you find out that there was no affection for Christ, there was no real hatred of sin, there was no real sense of Godward guilt, there was merely a temporary fear of hell. And the temporary fear of hell can be suppressed and distracted by many other things. The problem that happens in churches all too often is the temporary response to the fear of hell will get you through the baptistry and into church roles. And then whoosh, they're gone. That's what Bunyan's warning against. So how do you know that your faith's not temporary? There's an easy answer to that. It continues, right? That's the, that's the benefit of an allegory. You don't have to guess where temporary's heart lies right? Same way you don't, have to, you don't have to guess where faithful, hopeful, and Christian are. Um, but real people don't have names like that, do they? So how do we tell the difference? We tell the difference by the fact that good soil bears fruit and that fruit remains. Well, Christian and Hopeful leave the enchanted ground and they enter upon Beulah land, which lies just before the river of death within sight of the celestial city. Uh, Beulah land represents the saint's end of life. Uh, once sanctification has had its long work, uh, the pilgrimage is nearly done. The journey to the celestial city is near at hand. Uh, and so he represents it as a delightful land. It represents the, the, the rest that is at the very end of the life of the faithful. In this land, the shining ones commonly walked because it was upon the borders of heaven. Um, Bunyan believed, I, I did a, a I, I annotated and indexed his complete works, and I did it from a, 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 I did a systematic theological index of Bunyan's works. And under the, the category of angels, you would be amazed how many times Bunyan talks about angel, angels transport the soul 
from the body to the presence of God in heaven, right? That was just part of his angelology. Uh, and so in this land where people are dying, right, they're heading, they're crossing the river and heading in, angels are commonly walking, commonly uh, treading upon these borderlands. Um, so they're frequent visitors to Beulah land. Also in Beulah land, the contract between the bride and the bridegroom was uh, renewed. In other words, this is a land of assurance, of joy, and of hope. Uh, if, uh, you're, if you're quiet enough at certain times of the day, you can hear shouts coming from the celestial city. And I'll just tell you that when I read this, this scene reminds me of a nursing home. Um, I've spent a lot of times in, in, in nursing homes, particularly when I was in Buffalo. I was there every week. And when you walk into the room of a genuine saint, their body is at its end, but their souls are just glowing. It's like walking into Beulah land. They smile. They've got all day long for you. Generally, they have far longer than you have. And, and they are just a delight. They're full of stories of God's faithfulness. Um, they are full of wisdom. They're full of uh, just the joy. And it seems like they have regular conversation with the Lord that they're getting ready to meet. I have one lady's face particularly in mind who was in, uh, I can't remember the name of the nursing home in, in Buffalo. You walk next door to the room of an unbeliever, and it's like walking into the valley of the shadow of death. They're consumed with fear. There's no more bitter person than the unbeliever who's facing the end of their life, the end of their hope, the end of their journey, and they hate God, and they hate people, and they hate you. Thank you very much. Beulah Land is like the nursing home of Marjorie. You know, I cannot remember if that was her name, but I can still see her face. And she was, uh, she was a joy. Um, she probably at one time or another told me she saw angels. And Bunyan would have said, of course you did. You're about to die. <laughs> you know, that's, they're waiting to, to transport your soul to heaven. Uh, well, the sight of the celestial city is so beautiful that both Christian and hopeful are uh, struck sick with desire. Uh, they cannot look at the city straight on. It would be like staring into the sun. So they behold the city with an instrument made for that purpose. And he quotes 2 Corinthians 3.18, right? We behold these things as through a glass darkly, right? Um, so they rest and they sleep in the vineyards and the orchards of the king, and they're, they're so delighted that they talk in their sleep. Uh, they meet two men who shone like gold and also their faces shone in the light. These men are angels uh, and they give instruction to the pilgrims. They are told that they have two more difficulties to meet with before they may enter into the city. So they lead the, uh, the pilgrims to the river of death and they are informed that they have to cross the river themselves. Interestingly, once they cross, then these same two are right on the other side, you know, awaiting them as they, as they come. Uh, you must obtain it by your own faith they tell them. And so they go through the river, uh, or they have to go through the river because there is no bridge. And note what Bunyan says here, you must go through or you cannot come at the gate. The sight of the river strikes fear into the hearts of the pilgrims, especially Christian. And so they inquire of the angels whether the river is all of the same depth. And they said, no, Yet they could not help them in that case, for, said they, you shall find it deeper and shallower as you believe in the king of the place. Well, Christian and Hopeful then step foot into the river, and upon entering, Christian begins to sink, and he cries out in despair. And though Hopeful tries to encourage him that the ground beneath their feet is good, Christian loses all hope. Uh, let me read this to you, and then we'll, we'll end, and we'll come back, and we'll pick up the very end of it, especially ignorance's uh, end when we come back. Then said hopeful to Christian, be of good cheer, my brother. I feel the bottom, and it is good. Then said Christian, ah, my friend, the sorrows of death have compassed me about. I shall not see the land that flows with milk and honey. 
And with that, a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian so that he could not see before him. Also here, he in great measure lost his senses so that he could neither remember nor orderly talk of any of those sweet refreshments that he had met with in the ways of his pilgrimage. But all the words that he spake still tended to discover that he had the horror of mind, the heart fears that he should die in the river and never obtain an entrance in at the gate. Here also, as they that stood by perceived, he was much in the troublesome thoughts of the sins that he had committed, both since and before he began to be a pilgrim. It was also observed that he was troubled with apparitions of hobgoblins and evil spirits, for ever and anon he would intimate so, uh, so much by words. You know what I think he's describing? I think he's describing Alzheimer's. Uh... In Bunyan's day, people didn't die in hospitals, they died in homes. And it's hard to die. And many times, it doesn't come peacefully, especially not in a day before hospice and morphine. And so what, you, what I think that he's picturing is he's seeing things, he's seeing terrifying things. He's seeing terrifying things that, and I could be wrong, I, I could be, Bunyan could, Bunyan certainly believed in demons and evil spirits, and so do I. But the context of Beulah Land and the river of death and the fact that Hopeful doesn't see them and the fact that Christian is a faithful saint, I don't think he's actually being afflicted by these things. I think he's seeing them. And he's afraid. And in Alzheimer's, at the end of your life, you're afflicted by horrifying, scare. it's scary. And it doesn't mean you don't have faith. It's scary. And so you, you get the sense that Bunyan's describing the death scene of an old saint, he says, who has in great measure, do you catch this? Has in great measure lost his senses. In other words, he's suffering from senility. He cannot remember much of his journey. He's overtaken by fears. And Hopeful's words to him are encouraging. Hopeful, therefore, had much ado to keep his brother's head above water. Yea, sometimes he would be quite gone down, and then, ere a while, he would rise up again half dead. Hopeful also would endeavor to comfort him, saying, Brother, I see the gate and men standing by to receive us. But Christian would answer, It is you. They wait for you. You have been hopeful ever since I knew you. And you have two, said he to Christian. Ah, oh, brother, and he said he, surely if I was right, uh, no, I'm sorry. Ah, oh, brother, said Christian, surely if I was right, he, that is God, would now arise to help me. But for my sins, he hath brought me into the snare and hath left me. Then said Hopeful, my brother, you have quite forgot the text that is said of the wicked, that there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. These trouble and distresses that you go through, note this, these trouble and distresses that you go through in these waters are no sign that God hath forsaken you, but are sent to try you, whether you will call to mind that which heretofore you have received of his goodness." and to live upon him in your distresses. Then I saw in my dream that Christian was as an amuse a while, to whom also Hopeful added this word, be of good cheer, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. And with that, Christian break out with a loud voice, oh, I see him again. And he tells me, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Then they both took courage, and the enemy was after that as still as a stone until they were gone over. Christian therefore presently found ground to stand upon, and so it followed that the rest of the river was but shallow. Thus they got over. It's a really interesting way of depicting death, isn't it? It's shallow for some. It's deep for others. Hopeful walks through without much trouble. Christian is nearly drowned. Both make it. So we're going to pick up there next time as they go further up and further in um, into the celestial city. But let me, let me end. I had actually three applications. We'll get to the last two next time. But let me end with this one. It's hard work to die well, and no saint should have to cross the river of death alone. Uh, as is every phase of perseverance, so death is a corporate ministry because death is just the last phase of the perseverance of the saints. Death is scary. Uh, 
And sometimes its torrents overwhelm even those who are strong in faith like Christian. And so we need hopeful beside us in death, reminding us of the truth of the gospel, speaking words of encouragement and hope, though not a false hope like vainglorious who is willing to ferry ignorance across the river. Oh, you've got nothing to worry about. So I think the lesson is this. Dying and helping people die well is just as much a church ministry as anything else we do here. Don't leave it to the hospice workers. God bless them. Don't leave it to them. Don't be afraid of dying people. Hold their head above water because it's scary. It's hard work to die for some. But it's no indication that God has forsaken them or that they have no faith. So remember that. We'll conclude that and begin stage one of part two next time.